presentation by talking about 20-25 minutes about federated learning in general and then we will dive into the demo and after the demo if we have time I will also discuss I would like to sort of bring up a couple of, of research oriented topics around federated learning uh, so that's that's the plan there um, but I wanted to ask you guys because we weren't we, we don't really know who you are all of you and I just wanted to know a little bit about your background. So who of you are working in machine learning? So a couple of machine learning and, and computer science. Yeah, and so then we have, I guess, product and business domain application experts, I guess. But that's fine, I, I will try to sort of, so we, we're not gonna go very deep into a specific concept, but please feel free to interrupt me and ask questions if you have any. Any questions? And we have our colleagues here from Scalot as well. We have our lead scientists in AI here and in, in distributed infrastructures as well. Um, so we have, uh, we, we would be happy to sort of have a live discussion as well. Yes. <laughs> yes. So before we. Um, so, I'll sit down. Yeah. So before diving into this, I thought maybe you don't really know what Scalot is. So, so we're a company that was founded. Late 2016, so 2017 was our sort of uh, first operational year. Um, and we we're all about essentially bridging the gap between research and development in machine learning and production systems in machine learning. Uh, so we come from a, a background. Um, so me, Salman, and Ola, we, we all lead research groups in, in slightly different areas at Uppsala University. And we sort of started a company together and then together with, uh, with Morgan and Daniel and, and another guy called Jens, who's also from the more entrepreneurial side and business and product development. Um, uh, so we come from a background, both sort of leading our own research teams in basic research, but also working a lot in applied, on the applied side with strategy and infrastructure development for, for national scale uh, research. So Salman and I, we have been working as project leader and architect of building an open stack cloud in Sweden that spans essentially serves the whole Swedish research community with cloud computing resources and Ola has been working for a long time with, with SciLife Lab that you might have heard of about their data data management strategy and uh, nectar and sequencing platforms. So we sort of had that and that, that's from the background that uh, that led us into sort of forming a company we want to work with this uh, help people get machine learning pipelines in production. Uh, so this was Nick Cloud and Silaf Lab, and then in Scaleout we're collaborating, for example, with a company called Sayspin that also works in the cloud computing area, uh, doing doing sort of services and, and consulting there. Um, so uh, what we do on a so if you look at our web page, what you will find there is a concept called Lean AI, uh, which is essentially our take on processes and technology stacks for operationalizing machine learning, putting essentially pipelines in place that lets you go from, we have to establish continuous flows from, from data to production grade services. And, and we like to do this with the cloud native computing. So we work a lot with best of read open source stacks on top of Kubernetes. So if you look at Scalout's webpage, this is what you would find there. Uh, and we would be happy to talk more that, about that, of course, on another occasion or after this session. Um, yeah, so we have this kind of a training program uh, that essentially focuses on how do you form a good team with IT expertise, data science expertise, data engineering expertise, uh, and, and, and teach them to work together uh, effectively with cloud natives, the AI stacks to, uh, to establish, kind of go quickly from use case to production. Um, so there we're also collaborating in uh, you know, I guess is it official there? Yeah. What can I say about Darax? Yeah, of course. Yeah, so we're we're part of an alliance there with, with some great people with with background in enterprise AI transformation, uh, looking into how to embed this in sort of enterprise transformation programs in AI. So our part there is sort of lean mean AI teams, if you want to be a bit cliche. <laughs> uh, uh, so this stack here is not on the web page, but it's something where we want to open source pretty soon and start offering mm -hmm. services. And then we have a, a, a 
support concept as well that is quite unique where where we um, we don't essentially sell you a resource resource consultant but but more a, a, an application expert team that you can access remotely but this is not what i want to talk to you about today but i just wanted to give it a background because i guess you have perhaps not heard of the scale of that much before um so before we talk about federated machine learning we have to just Oh, anyways. So, we just have to recap sort of the centralized and then the normal machine learning paradigm. Um, so essentially when you do machine learning projects today, you have, you have two steps, and this is greatly simplified, but essentially two main steps. You, you Try to get as much data as you can into a centralized location so you pool, pool as much data you can. Because having a lot of data is kind of critical to building a machine learning model with good accuracy. We all know that. And then we have some sort of views the, the tools we like and the models we like and we train on top of this data. Um, so essentially you have this kind of flow where you try to get stuff working. So this is this is kind of where the lean AI stuff that I talked about. That's where it's sort of operating today in this space. Uh, and then you build a model and you can use it. The uh, problem is that there are many cases where, where this is not possible, right? I mean, for example, if you if you have private or proprietary data, you, you might not be so keen in pooling this data, sending, sending that to a cloud service, uh, or say that Jens and I want to we want to somehow collaborate on machine learning, but Jens doesn't want to send his data from Tesla Center to, to, to the university, and I don't want to send my data to Jens. But still, we're really, really interested in making this, this unique model because we want all the data in there. That would be good for both of us. So in that case, that, but that's not, that's not doable now. It just doesn't work with our company policy. We also have a regulated data GDPR uh, in many cases where you're not allowed to do this. So one example there, I mean, you have read about the money laundering scandals recently. I guess a big problem there, as far as I understand, is that you're, you're just not able to, it's not allowed to use data from different countries and, and banks uh, to make these kind of models. It's, it's prohibited, so it's regulated. It can also be that data is so large that you have data intensive um, infrastructure generating massive amounts of data. So it's just a, both a cost and a practical problem to pool in this data. We will fill up network bandwidths and it, yeah, it will be, a, frankly put, a pain in the ass and very expensive. So that's another reason why, in all of these cases, sort of this whole machine learning pipeline breaks because you're not able to centralize the data. So there will, there will be no model. Or there will be an inferior model you have to do it yourself. So the question essentially we're addressing with federated machine learning is, is how, how do we, can we get around this? Can organization collaborate on building machine learning models without giving up ownership of data or without, without pooling it? But still making a model that incorporates the information from all the data sets. That's what federated machine learning as a, a field tries to solve. And I mean, the idea is, is quite simple in principle. So instead of pooling all the data, like in the previous picture, we can, of course, Instead, push training to where the data is. So Jens data set and my data set, they stay where they are. But we instead push out uh, incremental models that get trained locally, and then somehow uh, squash together or merge together according to some algorithm or mechanism. And then you can imagine that if you iterate this, or if you do this in, in different ways, you will eventually arrive at a model that uh, incorporates all the data. It may, it may or may not be as good as the, or of the same fidelity as it would have been if you pulled the data, but it will be a lot better in many cases than if you just uh, did it yourself on your own sort of case. So this is... Uh, the basic idea of federated learning, then you can do this in different ways, of course. And this is a very, I say, very vibrant research field right now in, in decentralized computing and machine learning. Um, but not at all. It's been going on for a couple of years, and this year we are seeing a, 
a real surge in interest, I would say, from the research community, both from research intensive companies, the, the front runners in AI, and also from universities. Can I just ask you, yes. is it dependent on what kind of process step, or, uh, or is it any kind of data? This, this so far it is general, I would say. This, this idea is general for any kind of data. The, the, the premise, we're, the sort of assumption we're taking today is that we are not willing to pool the data. So you have a data set and, you're, and some, someone else has a data set. So it could be a, a company in a pre-competitive situation, for example. And it doesn't matter in, uh, where in process or, or <coughs> it's just the data. So you don't have it. just yeah, so, for me to understand. Yeah, so so, so 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 um, yes, in principle. But then, of course, you need to be able to to get to the stage where you do machine learning on your data. Mm -hmm. So I mean, the, and that that is part of sort of what happens here mm -hmm. locally. And this is a comp I will get back to this. This is obviously a, a major challenge mm -hmm. in itself. I mean, how how do you? This is essentially about how do you establish your your own internal. Machine. But if you can do that, then you can also uh, collaborate. So this is what federated learning is, is that so I, think I, I think, can I add one thing? Yes, uh, absolutely. Because so I'm also part of the scale yeah. but, but one of the like, requests we have, uh, or interests we also have in this, is from some very large companies that <laughs> seeing that their internal like data warehouse strategies are not succeeding as they plan. So where they have a a strategy to unify all their data, to structure it in one central place, so that even that internally is failing, mm -hmm. or it's not progressing as they have been planning. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's impossible even to succeed in them. So now then they have started to look at, okay, so are there alternatives? Let's assume that this fails. We cannot get to the point where we manage to get one big database internally, mm -hmm. where we have all the data. Um, then can we, can we instead by this or, or not just complete this problem. Mm -hmm. So that's another mm -hmm. possibility. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Uh, but I just wanted to mention then that um, sort of what one of the things to really kicked off this this area was a, was a very popular paper from 2017 by a, a guy who a team at Google. So they were interested to see if they could make, make a model that improved the functionality of the, the Android keyboard. Uh, by sort of using the autocomplete feedback from the user on how well autocomplete works, but without sort of sending this sensitive user data to central server. Uh, so they devised a, a dedicated system that is geared towards the case of, of cell phones um, and uses TensorFlow under the hood, so they have like a very light version of TensorFlow to run on a phone. Um, and this is one was one example of a specific federated learning system that we managed to construct the research team. And I think this this sort of showing that we could do this in, in one, for one specific case, and actually it was kind of a little bit useful. I think this has really sort of also searched the interest commercially or or someone's companies. So it is so taking it out of university, I would say. So that was good. So, so just to recap the setting uh, of the demo we will see, the basic premise is that, that we are looking at a situation where we're asking ourselves uh, two or more parties want to collaborate on building a machine learning model. Uh, are we okay to share the data? In, in case we are not, we can ask ourselves, would, would it be okay to share features? If we pre-process the data, so machine learning often starts with making feature engineering, so you yeah, you machine learning guys know what I'm talking about. So if, if, if we deem that this is okay, I mean, we, we should stay with, with our normal machine learning modes, because that, that's going to be far easier. Uh, but if, if we're in a situation where, where this is not possible, uh, we can also ask ourselves, is it okay to share the model or the parameters of a model? Is the model itself, the machine, is that sensitive? And that is something that will be model dependent, model specific, but in many cases, it it won't be, or you can show that it, it will not be at least easy to go from the model to, to learning about the underlying data. And then you can start dividing this situation, and I will not go into depth into that today, but into different situations. Well, uh, can I share model parameters? Uh, then I'm able, like in the Google case, to create one joint model 
uh, trained on all the data like that. If if I'm if I if, even if, if I don't want to do that, I mean I can still make a, a federated learning system by essentially training separate models and combining the predictions. But if, if I guess if I can share even predictions, then then you're sort of right. then you have to collect more data and stay with yourself. So we have some nice papers from all of this area, and we're working on some of this as well. So I just wanted to say that there are many ways to do federated learning. Yes. I don't think I understand uh, how if if you don't even share the models, you 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 can still make predictions using all of that. Yeah, so you can pull predictions. Or, uh, what do you, what do you think you about an ensemble models, for example. Yeah, you know what that yeah. is. So you train many different types of models and you then weigh together predictions. For example, by letting the models vote. If you want to have a classification problem, you have one model that says, is this a cat or a dog? It says cat. Yeah, this model also says cat. If even the model is private to, to whatever, the, the, the clients. Mm -hmm. So what do I do? I have client A. Do I run the data from client B through the model of client A? Or, or That's a good question. And, and this is where it becomes, that will, will it become complicated, I would say, because you have to solve that in some sense. But consensus protocols. But, so th that is a very hard situation. Mm -hmm. So we are really, I would say, this is kind of the sweet spot, I would say, mm -hmm. where you're able to choose models where you can disclose a little bit about parameters. Of course, even in that case, you will augment security with, with, with different mechanisms like multi-party computation or encryption. Um, but, but yeah, it's a very good comment. <clears throat> but just the key benefit so that you get that is that what we <coughs> deal with federated learning is that in this setting it promises to let you collaborate on building a stronger model than you would be able to do on your own. So this, this simple example is from our, our work on federated support vector machines that we are, so it's a work in progress, we're writing a manuscript about it. Um, so here we have a federated model and we have something called a lion size here. So in this case, we, we used a, a, a standard data set that is used a lot in machine learning research. And we take, took that and we did this, this thought experiment that what if I have all the data? Then I have a pool situation. If I start dividing it between me and Jens, so we, we take half of the data set each and form a machine learning a federated model. And then we're at the case of two here. And that's so forth. So we keep splitting this data until I think we have about eight training examples per member for the largest alliance size. And then we look at what happens. So this is the best model. We, uh, the worst we could train locally and the mean accuracy of, of everyone's individual models compared to a federated model. Uh, and as you can see then, of course, that there are for small alliances where you still have quite a bit of data, there is like a region where uh, for the best guy, it will be better to have your own model, but but someone else might uh, or might not perform as well. And this is of course hard to know. So this is a chance you would take. And then as sort of you have less and less data, remember the benefits of making a federated model becomes clear because that performance is kind of stable or <coughs> alliance size. Um, questions about that because I think this is like the important, the most important point. By 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 forming a machine learning alliance and using federated learning, you can build a model that, that, that is good even if you have very little data per member. Or if your data is, this is something worth looking at the paper, of course, if you have, if your data is uh, coming, if you have quite different um, domains in your test or in your training data. So, so I just noticed something. that the graph is logarithmic or exponential. Or uh, it's, it's a linear. Uh, um, thing we see here. So for any new node that you add, mm. have a, okay. yeah. And I think this will be uh, this observation might not generalize to other types of models, but uh, so in scale out, uh, we're we're talking a lot about production systems, and I just wanted to comment here that. What are what are, what what is the catch? Because this was all very nice. I did this in my Python scripts. Now, if I want to do this in reality, 
the author included that uh, this box here sort of represents the box I had on the first slide. This is your whole uh, local machine learning pipeline that we know is pretty hard. So this is the part where you, on your own site, train this model and serve it and in yesterday I put it in production, make it available for predictions or for training. So this is, this is hard. So we want to do federated learning. We essentially have to do this across many organizations. And we also need uh, federated components that, that deal with, with things like how do you put the models together? How do you weigh them together? How do you combine the predictions? Uh, you want to have stand state of our security. You will probably want to have components that, that tries to protect against adversarial behavior. And you want, want pipelines then for everyone to be able to, com to consume the, the model you produce in the end and deploy that so that you have sort of this additional layer of complexity. Uh, so like I said, it, it, it takes a lot of expertise and knowledge, not just in machine learning, but in information security, in system security, in cloud computing. It doesn't really have, it's not enough with centralized clouds. So you need to know a little bit about fog computing as well. Fortunately, someone is an expert on that, so that helps for us. Uh, but, but there's a lot of these things and also uh, adversarial behavior that occurs. So I think the conclusion is that uh, there is a considerable increase in systems and developer complexity if you compare it to the standard case. Yes, the gains are big, but, but this is the price you will pay that on a system level things become more. And I think this, this brings us to today's demo because at scale out, <coughs> I mentioned that services, so this is the product that we're working on. We want to make federated learning uh, production ready. And no one else has, has done that. Uh, it is still an environment research research area, but um, the time is right, I think, to start talking about how we operationalize this. And this is what we want to do in scale up. Um, so we do federal ML research, we do that a lot at the university these days, but uh, when in scale out, we, we take that knowledge and turn, try to turn that into something that will work in real life. Um, and this we call is a working name scale of fees. So, and if this is what we see today is, is the first minimal viable product of fee. This is something we have worked hard on for not that long actually, but a, a little while. Uh, and it's also been funded by Uppsala Innovation, which is the university's innovation. So we have a little bit of validation funding from them to, to try to see if we can. Turn this into a problem. I think we, we, we can see, but I think we did it. I think we did it. <laughs> I'm looking at Morgan here because Morgan is the guy that did all the hard work. So, what you will see today is essentially a, a platform uh, that has a bit of this, these federated components, and also it will be uh, local machine learning. Uh, in this case, it will be on laptops, but, but in general, this will be on machine learning platform. A uh, big sort of direction that we are taking because you could you could think of this as okay you, you take a platform and you try to <coughs> that federate because you could take TensorFlow and make federate the TensorFlow and people are doing that and that's that's good. We sort of want to take a more practical approach that that not all models will be run in a certain framework and things will change. So we're trying to see that we're trying to build something that will essentially work with your enterprise pipeline for local machine learning. Um, but make it easy to scale this out into our lights. This is the uh, and we're building everything also on cloud native computing principles. So it's, it's based a lot on uh, microservices and uh, open source best to build open source stacks. I just wanted to mention, I think we can go back. I have some examples. So just, just to sort of complement Jens' example, this is the last slide before I will promise I will show you the, show you the stuff after this. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, uh, yes, yes, so you will try to, since, since we're showing an early MVP, I just want you to ask them the big picture. Where, what, what do we think this is good for? And I mean, one thing that I think 
example I want to bring today is that this technology will let you say that you are a manufacturer of, of physical infrastructure instruments. Many of us are, uh, not me personally, but in this case we have antennas or radio base stations. Uh, these produce data, uh, and this company that makes these antennas, they will sell that to different different clients. So the clients will own the data that this thing produces. But you want to, you, of course, you want to have high level, high value software offerings on top of your product, and then you want them to use machine learning, and you want, of course, to be able to leverage everyone's data. All to, to the benefit of all your clients, but they might not be willing to share. It could be regulated, for example. So by taking our platform, we'll essentially solve the problem of putting together a federated machine learning system with components in the fog and federated components that can then be used to make high-level software offerings. So, so one mode would be, for example, that this infrastructure vendor owns. I mean, they, they know you know what you what you want to build, what product you have. Um, so by sort of integrating with the fear system, you will be able to, uh, to to put machine learning components in your software that, that are federated. So this is one example. We have more, but I will tell you. So it's time, Morgan. Oh, it's time. Okay. It's the first public yeah. demo. Oh. <laughs> World premiere. Yes. Nice. And if, if we fail, we have videos. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I will start off a little bit. So I would say that modeling, uh, the machine learning modeling will be different for different projects, different data, what kind of model you want to use. Not every model will be as easy to do in a federated case as others. Uh, but but there are some steps in common to I would say to all federated learning flows, and I mean you, you need to form a machine learning alliance. That's essentially step one. Uh, you need to initiate a federated model that has to be done by someone, a data scientist. Uh, you you construct this model, and this this is what you do for you. And then of course you have to sort of have a way to, to consume the model. Uh, and to make sort of things as easy to understand as possible, I we show them to. The demo is based on the hello world of machine learning based on MNIST digits data set. So the problem is essentially, very, this is a very classic problem we do in, in a lot of machine learning courses. Um, so we have essentially a, a data set, the data set of handwritten digits that are digitized into 28 by 28 images. Um, and it's a multi-class classification problem. So the problem is given that input image, you're going to predict what digit it was. Um, um, uh, so we will, we will sort of do a hello world of a federated machine learning by doing this in a federated setting. And just to, um, to demonstrate a little bit, I have with the caveat that I am not uh, responsible for front-end programming in scale, but I made this little, <laughs> this little app here. So this is the product we're building. Uh, we are going to make a, a really sweet app that will let you write a digit and classify it. But in order to do that, we have to build a model. So I have to do this. I want to make this app. And this is, uh, of course, a really high value product that a lot of people will love. But I guess it's really nice if it is able to classify these correctly. And I mean, Jens, maybe he'll, he loves the DD2, for example. I know that. So <laughs> he will really hate this tool if it can't classify tools. He will, just, he will sit there and write tools all the time. And um, uh, so let's build a model for this. And then we have a little, it's actually, <laughs> it's very tiny. I will try to make this large. Uh, so let's look at this Jupyter notebook. Can you let me know when you can see the text in the back? No, not yet. Not yet. No? Yeah, um, so we'll then do one more then. Yeah. Yes. So we're going to use a library called Scikit-Learn. If you are a data scientist, you know this. If you're not, it doesn't matter. It's, it's a machine learning library. Uh, and we have, so I want to make this up, and I have some training data. 
Um, and let me see what it looks like. Uh, my company collected this data over the course of one year. It was some guys that, that labeled images. Uh, so I have I have 2,366 images, um, and they look look like this. Um, so this is digitization of someone wrote the letters. They did it six here. <clears throat> so let's look at my data set. So this is a little bit um, the situation that <laughs> I, sorry for Jens, I have very few tools in my data set. So MNIST, this data set is, is very well prepared, very balanced, and you can achieve extreme accuracy on this if you just use the, uh, the sort of data sets. So it's, it's often seen as too easy for real world problem, but this is our way to making it a little bit more real life, more like it will be in reality that the data is not perfect and uh, it's not collected. So this is this is sort of this is what we have. Uh, but based on this data set, I am able to build a classifier that will take this image as input and it will predict the uh, result. And I will not run this cell because it takes a little bit of time even if the data set is small. Uh, so I pre run it before we came here just to save some time. But essentially what we see here is something called a classification report uh, of the precision recall F1. And this doesn't matter if you don't know machine learning, if you do, you know what they are. But, but what you can see here, for example, is you have pretty bad, you have pretty good performance, not for, for being MNIST, if you had the entire data set and you had state-of-the-art model, you, you could attain 99%, 99.7 on this data set. Uh, but we're doing this with a stochastic gradient descent way you're building a support vector machine. Um, and the data is not perfect because I sabotaged it in this case. Uh, but you can see that the performance varies quite a bit. It's not super good for tools. Uh, assuming that you were a comp another company, I mean, you, you might be in a similar situation, but you also have your data set. But maybe your data is, uh, yeah, you, this, this guy actually has more of these examples so, and a few others. In the same, same way, this company is able to build a model as well. Uh, but it has some sort of, in, the, in this case, the, the performance on the digit eight was was pretty bad. Uh, but so, I mean, the way to make this better now, if you don't use federated learning, is to to improve your data set. Because now we assume that we have built the best possible local model. To um, so th this is of course possible, but it's a bit hard. On the other hand, if if these two, if if my, me and company A were able to put to pull this data. Um, I would, of course, get a, a more balanced data set and also a larger data set, twice as large. And you can see that I, I would be able to, uh, so, so high is good there. It should be close to one, then it's good. So you can see that this in this situation, it, it kind of improves. Um, yes, questions about that. This is the setting. I could take either of these models now and deploy it and use it in my application. Maybe I've done that, even. not sure. No, I haven't done that yet. Right. So in summary, uh, this is not good. My application will suck. It will be an artificial intelligence system that is really terrible at uh, classifying some digits. Uh, so let's fix that. Uh, I will call my friend Morgan. Morgan likes Digis too. He yeah. has collected a lot of them. Yes. Right, Morgan? Yes. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> so maybe we can make an alliance. We can try to improve our, both our situation. Uh, mm -hmm. That's true. I, I, I will be, I'm prepared that you can use the model, um, but you cannot have my data. Okay. That's fine. You can't have my data. Okay. okay. That's fine. Uh, so what I will do now, I will use fear, and this is where things get really scary, <laughs> <laughs> and also very very small. So I will should should I call you up on Slack and you can show my screen as well? So yes, do that. That's a uh, fantastic idea. Sound. Let's see if the Slack infrastructure. Yeah. Hello, Morgan.
So yeah, this is me. Yeah. Yes. So I will pop up a terminal. I should probably try to make this a bit larger as well, right? Huge. We go here. So I have prepared sort of a little bit of example folder here where I will now act as the model initiator. Can start. Can start. Absolutely. No, uh, <laughs> okay. All right. um, so in order to start an alliance, I have to make a, a, a okay, right, so we have a little essentially um, project file where we point this to now the, the fear federated system. Uh, and this is all so I will remove this all the time. Uh, and I will just use fear APIs to create a global model. We're going to make a global SVM, federated SVM. And I will create a new alliance. I will call it the Digital Alliance. I will initiate myself as a, uh, this is sort of a model initiator agent. Uh, and I will say this alliance. Uh, so I will execute this. And we have a new alliance um, created uh, with an ID. I have a member ID. Mm -hmm. uh, so now Morgan can go to uh, the mm -hmm. portal. Yes. So uh, I'll go and grab this. Show, show my hat. <laughs> Screen there. So, well, what I'll, I do at this point is then. So, Andreas has told me that he has created an alliance uh, and he has told me the, the uh, address to our alliance uh, uh, UI, our website. And so, I'll, I will use the login. Uh, I have a pre created account that Andreas has given me. Oh, uh, 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 and I can see here that there is an alliance created now. Um, nothing has been done yet. Uh, there's only one initiating member, uh, but I get an alliance ID here that I can use. So I'll grab that alliance uh, ID. I've also opened up my projects file. Saving my there, um, <coughs> giving a na name to my membership, and I got an ID, and I have I'm attached to the alliance. So now I can use the now I can use the the, the, the CLI runtime to start the client. Or mm. should you maybe you should I can do it first? Um, first, and to attach. So I will go in this window here. I can just use this one. Uh, I have now initiated alliances, so I was the alliance initiator agent. But in order to be able to train a machine learning model, I also, of course, have to have some sort of, of training client online. Uh, so we have that here. Uh, this guy needs, of course, to deal with pointing to the local data. In this case, this is the enemy's data set on my computer. but in a production setting um, for a real life experiment. For example, this would be then integrating with your data lake or your, your data pipeline, essentially. Um, but but we, we sort of have a data directory here. I have also prepared, because I, I sort of play with this notebook, so I have a little bit of a training uh, file that tells you, this, this essentially specifies what will happen when a, when a request comes to me for updating the global model, what will I do? So I will say I will I will fetch a model candidate. I will 
uh, load my training data. Uh, I will do a couple of epochs or passes of stochastic gradient descent on this data. I will not converge it fully because it's better to iterate across the alliance. But I will do that and I will submit the candidate model. Um, so this is, the, in, in this case of SVMs, this is, is what needs to be done there locally. I have also prepared a um, little bit of code to, to validate the global model. So I have set aside uh, for my member a little bit of test data that I have. So somehow we need to sort of try to measure how accurate the global model will be. In this case, we don't assume that we have a public test set. So Morgan has one and I have one. Uh, we are able to score the global model on this set, test set and then combine the scores into a global model score. So this code just uh, does that. It fetches the model using the fear APIs um, and, and it computes essentially a, a, a measure of accuracy. In this case, I think it is precision that is being returned. Um, and then I need the project file. So I will take that from my model initiator folder. And then if all, all goes well, I am able to, and I should mention, uh, you can of course, in, you, you will normally dockerize these agents um, and run them so you can scale your Docker container services as you wish in your Kubernetes cluster. But for pedagogical reasons, I think it's better to show what is happening inside. So this would be sort of actually running in a container. Um, but, but this is what it's doing now. So I will, I will start my, I will actually write fear AI run client. First, I need to attach to the alliance, so I will do that first. And that's um, set to starting a new member. Um, so what should I call myself? I will call myself yeah, I will just call myself Andreas. Okay. And um, maybe more when you can check it, did we get the number? I can check. I'm just oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is the confusing. Yes. Now I lost my. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Too small. Yes, look yes. at that. Yes, we have two Andreas. offline members right now. Yes. So I will bring my app and make it ready for training. Um, I will do that by, by using the fear client. Client run, right? Uh, wrong client. Run client. So um, I'll, I think I'll join as well. I want to. I'm also attaching. So now we are sort of ready for training. Yes, now we're idle. Yeah. Yes, ready. So at this point, we're ready to start building a mod, a federated model. Um, and then you have a little window here. Uh, we have something, um, and this this is an agent that can run either on the on the register or the central server, or it can run at my location. It's it uses the fear fear a fear APIs to orchestrate the construction of the global model. So it essentially this is where we implement federated learning for this particular model, the flow of actions taken by the alliance in order to form the model. And here as well, I need the. Um, and I think um, maybe it's good to point out that even though we're doing this in Python, it's mm -hmm. uh, we're this framework is built that it's uh, you can run C or Julia or whatever you want uh, locally. Yes, and you and we are also, also according to that language or which framework framework you prefer. You can mm -hmm. um, the the only thing that's important is to communicate how you will convey your models or data to mm. the other alliance members. Mm. But it's a, uh, yeah. So I think I will start 10 iterations of model learning. 
vill att vi ska se så att yes. vi kan göra så Okay. Do you want to sh show this live on your computer? Or? Yeah, maybe I can show it. It's a bit hacky over Slack. Maybe you should open it up on your. Yeah, I can do it. That's true. So essentially, what I did is essentially I started the the flow of um, the the training cycles, and you can see now. But right now, my agent is training. Maybe I can make it larger. Some reason it won't scale. Yeah. I'd say it's starting to struggle here a little bit. Maybe I should turn off. Um... Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, here. Now we can see, right? Yeah. Uh, so, so what you will see here is that you are cycling between training and validation uh, runs. So right now the, the me and Morgan are validating the latest global model in the Federated Alliance. And here in this graph, uh, you sort of start seeing the, the convergence of, of the model. Uh, and we just also made this little tool here that we can actually look at the latest model, we can get the classification report. Um, so we can sort of follow how the federated model evolves and increases in accuracy. But are you locally validating the data now? So you're not sharing any data, you're locally validating the global model on your exactly. data. Uh, exactly. Yeah. So when, when that Andreas ball turned black, mm -hmm. that means I have fetched my local, the global model to this laptop mm. and then it's running validation on my test data that's on my laptop and returning the score and then it's aggregating them together and the same for training. So th this is the point, the data is never pulled now, it's, it stays, we have data on Morgan's laptop and on mine and the laptops are of course then, you know, in real life uh, data lakes or data centers. But the other question, you're actually sending out the model training a number of epochs, yep. sending them back, fusing them, yes. sending out a new validating back. Exactly, exactly. And what you see here in this graph is the aggregated model score. So it's the model score averaged over Morgan's and mine test data in this case. And here, of course, there's, there are different ways to do this. So this we have assumed that there is no shared test set. You could also imagine that an alliance might be able to agree on a public test set. But not share the training data. So there's, there's all these kind of combinations of what you are willing to share that will dictate what type of model you can build and how you will do it in the best way. And that is something you have to sort of look at at, at a case by case basis. I'd say in this case we are assuming we share we don't share training data, we don't share test data, but we are okay with sharing the coefficients in the uh, produced SVM. Yeah. Right, and, and this will just keep doing doing what it's doing. It will converge a bit slowly, uh, I guess. Um, so I think we'll do a scanning. Yeah, two five. No problem. No. Talk on GitHub. But other way, I mean, this is um, this is kind of like um, how you do federated learning with feed. So just for my clear for clarification for me, Jim, uh, the validation of this model, it's done locally, but then merged together uh, uh, as a validation model. Or is it is it so in the vacation uh, example, for instance? Uh, yeah, sure. So what is happening in this model is that we initiate a, a global model M which is a stochastic gradient summit uh, based SVM classifier. Uh, when in each round of the training, this model will be downloaded by these two clients. Uh, it will be trained, it will be optimized a couple of iterations on my training data or a subset of my training data. So that is what will happen first. Uh, and 
And actually, in this case, it's done one at a time. Because this is essentially the inverse of online learning, if you know what that is. Instead of streaming the data to a central model, you're streaming out the model to the data, updating the model, and then going to the next uh, data owner. Doing this in this way. And the validation step is just because we want to measure how accurate it is. Exactly. But the, I can, of course, download that and do it myself and don't share that knowledge with you guys. Mm. But since we want to be able to, I mean, I think it's, it's fair that all the members of this alliance can assess how this model improves. And here, more, me and Morgan, we agreed upon this in the beginning, that the way we will measure uh, performance of the model, and, and in the end, this will affect how we do optimization on the model, is that we say that we take the average of our scores. Mm -hmm. We could agree that, that we will take the worst, so that uh, it will optimize for making the worst case scenario as good as possible. But we said in this case, we do the average, and this is what that appears. Mm -hmm. So in the validation round, the, global, the latest candidate global model gets pushed to the clients, scored on the local test data, and the score is weighted together. And this is so, what it is. When, I mean, it's only one client that is updating the model at a time. At a time, yes, in this particular example. You could also think, in the case of several deep learning, um, and probably also in this case, we, we wanted to have a simple example. And you could also take, if you say that you have 100 members, you can take a subset of 20 at a time, all of them update the global model, and then you try to average coefficients. That's a different way of making the model, and they will have different convergence properties. So these are the type of questions that, that the research community is heavily engaged with. How do you make the thing, and that is essentially how do you make it to converge as fast as possible without disclosing information. So those, that's a very, very good question. So where were we, Morgan? I think it's finished this time. Yeah, do you want to start uh, another couple of rounds perhaps? And well, maybe we should have a look at if we add more members to the room. Yes. So should we do that before or after I start a couple of rounds? Should we try to improve the model and invite 10 of our friends? Or yeah, sure. Our friends? Yeah. Let's invite a couple of friends. Um, um, show my screen there. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, so just to, to show that we can we can scale this. We have I built a Docker container here in the background um, based on our new alliance uh, membership. And I'm gonna see if we can up, uh, let's say, how, let's say five, let's take five members. And let's see, we're creating, and I'm, in this case, uh, for demoing purpose, I'm generating the names and I'm starting up the, the mem members. And let's see if we have some more members yeah, going yeah. in. Yeah, so you we can show in your work. Yes, sweet. Yeah. Now we're talking, now we actually have a lot of data. So I think I will run, I will start 50 rounds, or I will do 50 more rounds. And then we can talk a little bit about what we have done while this alliance trains a bit. So let's do that. Great. Yeah. <clears throat> Hope the network is with us now. Yeah, so I think it takes a little bit of time. Yeah, so it's it's going. And you can see now we have more validation contributions. So while this is doing its thing, I think we I wanted to show a couple of more slides. So I will I will let Morgan say something about what it is that we are. What, what, what have you seen? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so what we, what we, as Andreas mentioned, we looked at this, is, uh, it's, uh, this problem is uh, it's getting vastly more complex when you introduce, uh, I mean, the ML pipeline is a, is a big problem in itself or can be uh, quite a hurdle to get working. But in this decentralized way or in this uh, um, alliance way, um, um, it can it introduces even more complexities regarding I mean how how do you, how do we secure this alliance how can we secure data at rest uh, where do we store our models uh, how how do we secure communication um, and we have um, we have looked at those questions and and try to answer uh, all of them with with our architecture so basically 
what we have okay. so basically our, our major components uh, uh, we of course run all everything in microservices so we can scale the back end uh, individually all, all, all uh, based on the needs we have uh, and those are exposed through communication endpoints as you see you see the alliance uh, uh, live now uh, connecting to our communication endpoints in this case we run a trusted third-party provider configuration. So we have a pointed out register that is actually in charge of, of, of um, orchestrating this alliance. Um, we have also, in this case, uh, where we're on this setting, we have a central mo model store where we can upload uh, models. We, you can, of course, store that within within the company as well or within another provider based on and based on your needs. And it's, of course, in this case, we're running an S3 compatible storage uh, solution. So you can, but you can choose basically the backend side, you can, you can uh, uh, tailor that to your organizations or your alliance needs. Uh, as you saw, we also have a front end uh, push for easier conveying some information regarding the alliance uh, where you can set up your own modules, show your, your own graphs, uh, uh, based on on the needs or based on the models that you mm. that you that you're working with um, within the company, and this is yeah, I think this is important to see that okay, no data is ever leaving these individual alliance companies. On, or in this case, we're 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 conveying the model, so in in sense, I mean, literal sense, that's also data, of course, but but then we have to make sure that that the model is transported securely, stored, uh, encrypted, and so on. Uh, <clears throat> within, but what, what you see here within the companies as well is that um, they all use the same client library. It's a very generalized library, and it's exposing its functionality to the CLI, which you saw that we were running. And it's also providing a runtime. So the model initiator uses the, uses the runtime and the CLI uh, to, to initialize. The members can do this, of course, and one way to do this in, within an alliance to get up and running very quickly is that you, the model initiator can package a member uh, uh, Docker, Docker file and then send it over, hand it over to other people, that <coughs> other members who just can point in the data. So that's basically one thing uh, so to get started very easily when this can share. Um, I mean. Yeah, I mean, it was in the case that, that I the slide I had about if these these were instruments. I mean, then and you would prepare a training code, and you just need to figure out a way to deploy it with each instrument. Essentially, yeah. Yes, and then we'll also um, for for the for model serving, uh, you can also use the same client library, the runtime, and the client application that uh, Andreas mm -hmm. mentioned a little bit earlier. That's an example of what you can then take the models, use the runtime, and then deploy locally uh, or expose it through some API. Yeah. However, you can, how, consuming the model however, however you want, basically. Exactly. Yes. Should we take a quick look at us to see how yeah. our model is doing? Yeah. Let's um, do so it's still working. Um, can you see the? Can you look at the report, maybe? Perhaps Let's take a look at. It. It's slowly improving here, actually. The model. Um, we can look at the report, and I mean this will keep improving. I should mention to you now that uh, we have done in order to. This is a hello world example. The, the local training is actually not that heavy in this case, so so there is actually a little <coughs> bit of, of sleep in the in the training, so that you will be able to visualize the different flows. In a real life situation, this will of course not be a problem because your actual machine learning training will be very fast. <laughs> but this is this is our latest model. So every time this thing appears, um, I will go back to my Jupyter notebook here and, and just take a look at uh, at this. And I think this one, if I remember correctly, I have this already in my member catalogs I, or folders. I have the project YAML file staged there. So I should be able to use now this API to just attach to the alliance. Uh, this this notebook is now running on my laptop. It's again private, um, and I should be able to sort of get this model from the latest global model. Of course, I could get any version of the model, but I usually want the latest one and, and use it. And uh, exactly, you can see I can just in this case from my client consume the model um, and, and look at it. So it's 
we can already see it's, it's better than the, um, the one I was able to build myself. It's still not as good as this highly converged model that I, I pre-trained by pooling the data, but it will eventually get there as the federated system progresses. Um, coming back to my little uh, application. So what I have done in this, I have used essentially this code embedded in the app. So whenever I predict, I try to use this app to predict something, it will fetch, uh, fetch the global model using the Python API, uh, stage it and, and use it for prediction. Um, uh, as we can see, it's still, it's still not very good. So there are many reasons for this. So why, um, okay, this was one example. Let's see if we can do a three here. Yeah, it, it did okay on the three there. I think it was easy. Uh, the point being here that, of course, now I'm not in the domain anymore where I'm, uh, this is not my training data, this is my new data. I does say it wasn't part of the training or test set. Um, I done some, some image processing to uh, try to mimic this MNIST data and, and score it. But uh, this is also, of course, an opportunity now in a federated learning system to feed back into the the model, and this is, for example, the, the, what Google did with the cell phones. So in this little silly example, I, I have this functionality that I can actually uh, save my examples. And now it will just tail this, it will just add that to the training corpus mm -hmm. that I'm running locally. And now, sort of, in, in future epochs, this data will be part of the federated model training. Uh, Morgan could do the training or, or any number of clients in order to sort of build a, a locally customized uh, corpus. Um, and this is, of course, a way also to tap into sort of transfer learning um, to if you have, have some sort of public data set, you can train as a seed model and you start and then improve it. I didn't like, so this was wrong, so I will correct it and I will. So if I had, if I had a call my life, I would sit here and do a couple of thousand digits and eventually it will improve because it will improve on the, on the public test training data, but it will also yeah, improve them because of feedback from me. So this is this is kind of like the basic idea of federated learning. Are you super tired or do you want to hear a little bit about some of the research challenges that that is also underlying? Yes. I want to say, yes. yeah, uh, I was thinking about if one of the users has really poor data, you don't want to include that in the training. Do you have, do you have support functions in your API for like not uh, use all data or something like that? I think you're getting into the research question. <laughs> 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 but but uh, right now, sort of, there's some. We, we, there, there is no way for me to know what data Jens has. There should be no way for me mm. to know that. So if there are, it will be in Jens' machine learning pipeline. If he's an alliance member, he will he will try to take care of this. But what what if Jens deliberately puts mm. bad examples mm. in his data to sabotage my model? Exactly. That's what I was asking for when I asked you the question there. Mm. If, if say that we're uh, collaborating on what is the best uh, model for a vacation, mm. and then I have a personal reference that I, I absolutely don't want to go to a five star hotel, mm. and the recommendation tells me that that's what you're gonna do. Like, if I have a personal uh, mm. filter or validation model yeah. that yeah. can actually uh, make somewhat of a like antivirus filtering thing, you see. Yeah. So I think uh, protection against those type of adversarial behaviors is a really hot research topic in machine learning in general and federated learning in particular. And I think if you, I will just say a few words about that in. Two minutes. So I will let you yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So um, about the current uh, roadmap of, of, of what we are building now, the MVP one is what you see is running right now. Um, it's a, just a basic protocol for covering this communication and allowing for this uh, machine learning in the distributed setting. Um, second MVP that we will we're working on is the alliance security hardening uh, and it's both from an infrastructure perspective to make sure that we can comply with with all the different regulations that that companies uh, uh, incur on all their IT infrastructure uh, we look at in 
uh, adding IDP providers and, and, and other types of federated authentication and uh, body tracking as well for how the members are behaving. Uh, but um, and also we will tie in a little bit to the research questions, but I'll let Andreas talk about that. Uh, because it's also related to security. Um, and then we have, for the MVP3, we will look at additional model types, like ensemble learning models, uh, deep learning models, uh, and so on. And we will also start, uh, hopefully start our first alliance uh, running uh, with some partners. Um, and then actually for the Q4 MVP, we have, uh, we want to open up the table here that we, we have for partners to be able to jointly prioritize uh, the features in, in lying ahead. So. Hmm. Can I, I just wondering about the marketing, how common is it, or, or you haven't started Alliance yet, but how common do you see that this can happen and what kind of uh, organizations or industry are starting with this? Um, Since we are in, within life science industry. Yeah, I think we, we can, I think this is very, I think, um, I think this is applicable to to a vast range of industries. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, from automobile to to healthcare and, and services, uh, yeah. infrastructure. Uh, and, 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 name it. But yeah. how common do you see that the people are mature to to to, to go in, into this, <laughs> or or organizations? Uh, Daniel, maybe. Uh, yeah, so some con concrete examples uh, that are like, interested in this. So there's, um, first, if you, could, you have these different, three different kinds of data, basically, but um, in, on the regulated side, so where we have like uh, one, one topic where we're doing the same demo just in a week or so uh, is around. Uh, Ray, ray or well, radiation therapy, for instance. So where you cannot you cannot pool and share data between hospitals. So, mm -hmm. so you have systems in, within different hospitals, and you want to share and aggregate data between hospitals. And uh, so they are red, like they have this this issue today. So another example where they have these issues is this a very large manufacturing company within, um, or uh, so they're doing trucks and cars. Mm -hmm. Um, that have struggles with these data warehouse and data lake projects, where they, so they they have these de separate data silos and can't integrate them together. So that's another example. And another um, example that we have for advanced talk with this uh, with the, uh, where you have uh, in this case some uh, like units or, or alliance members that don't have internet access uh, at all times. So it's very impractical to, uh, they cannot have an online setting where they share data and or pool data. So they need to have local machine learning models, mm. um, but then at some points need to be able to get together and, and coordinate and update mm. individual. Learning. So like it covers basically all of this, uh, this, this different case you have, on the first, like the sensitive data uh, level, there are companies in there, but this really ties into the level of maturity within companies as well. Uh, so this this is too early. If you if you haven't started to do like in general machine learning projects and proof of concepts, because you first have to discover all the challenges that to get your first like pilot cases done, and then you will find challenges with taking that into production. But is it more uh, like uh, in the IT organizations or production organizations? <laughs> yeah, so this this usually comes out when when there is a machine learning mm -hmm. unit within companies, then they understand these issues. Mm -hmm. So if you're talking about uh, organizational level, mm -hmm. if you if if the like AI or machine learning maturity is still on a level like let's do AI. Mm -hmm. Oh, that is true. Yeah. And I think in that case, I think yeah. the answer there is that that's really a problem for IT and data science and yeah. product development. And this is what is that they mentioned quickly what we have on the page now is like lean AI concept is trying to make that work mm -hmm. for for your first machine learning AI pilots. Mm -hmm. So this is essentially 
taking a step ahead. And I think we have, I mean, we are, we have been working on this for a little bit, bit of time and um, we are seeing that the interest sort of, as I said, the interest is really growing very rapidly from 2017 to now mm. in this area. Um, going from being an, a problem dealt with at universities to recently also at research units of, of large AI frontrunners and then to us, I think. But I think there are a, a number of different, few different serious projects in this area apart from ours. I think we are the only one that has this kind of strict focus on trying to take it into production. So most people are interested in a particular machine learning framework and trying to solve some security aspects of that. We are trying to do it as a platform. I, I see a lot of reports are writing about e-health and uh, predictive, uh, predictive yeah. health yeah. and this kind of So space. I prepared these slides and I oh. said, I think one, one thing that I will be, and uh, I think would be very, very important to work with, this is not something we are working with, but that I sort of envision for this technology, is for example, uh, inter integrity preserving smart homes in in say home care, in Sweden we have a home care system where elderly people live at home for longer and longer times, and this is really really hard. So I, I grew up in a very small town in northern Sweden, and you're sort of demounting the healthcare system step by step. But then digitalization is, is a very far along there, I would say, when starting putting up even today they are actually in, in trials putting up video cameras in in bedrooms, monitoring these elderly all the time, and then they have like a surveillance dashboard where they look at them. I mean, this can, of course, be highly integrity. Okay. Uh, this kind of technology would, for example, let you push that uh, and make it a little bit more ethical, trying to, to, to build models, pushing it out in the homes, for example. So that's one area I see. Uh, the slide I put up is also like we, we discussed this, you know, fleet management and uh, predictive maintenance or in situations where sort of you really want to include the behavior of persons in these models, but that can be highly integrity uh, violating. This type of technology lets you do that, uh, promises to do that without violating the person's integrity. But do, do you see it like today that it is coming more and more that they are combined to the pharmaceutical companies or is it just to measure like all these cameras for the end users that are combined directly to the <coughs> The so I, I think that the interest is more, much more, uh, not so much on the end user side. So it's much more in enterprise organizations that are further along, so in manufacturing, but across different industries. And and like this, like you said, the first step is that you have to have like have get or have to have started with some kind of AI product to figure out this that because in order to do AI, you need. You need IT operations, mm -hmm. you need the data, and you need domain experts, and you need to have all of these already working together, otherwise it doesn't work. So all of these hurdles must, like you must already overcome that. Yeah. I think that's one reason I also pushed this example in the early slide where I would like, where I personally would like to see pilots happening soon, mm -hmm. is this case of smart software on top of, of physical instruments or infrastructure. Because there we have the luxury of, of at least having some sort of structured data acquisition pipeline. The data is a bit standardized in many cases. So it will make the, the plumbing of federated learning easier to handle than, for example, smart homes or fleet management, where I mean those are there will be more, more data management hurdles there. So I think that um, that's a, a very interesting. And also with the, with the regulations like GDPR, these kind of frameworks allow organizations to really follow the guidelines and they can provide the solution and still do all their fancy nitty gritty. But I should also think, getting back to, I mean, who are doing this? Uh, no one is doing this in production today. Yeah. We, are, we are probably the first company that I know of. There might be more working in stealth mode but that, are, that are trying to take this to, I mean, as I said, the challenge is quite is quite large, and I I mean, uh, we're kind of early in our product development to show the roadmap there. So this is something we see evolving over the next couple of years. We we have made the analysis that in two or three years, uh, this this area will be booming and mature for a lot of use cases, and we want to start working on those use cases now. 
to build specific products based on this technology in collaboration with others that are domain owners. So I mean something going to what? Sorry, you yeah. don't have any competitors today then? Amazon's, uh, Microsoft, they are not doing anything in this area. So the, because we cannot know everything everyone is doing. We know that there are a couple yes. of open source projects. Uh, if you look, maybe I will, I will show the slides. I mean, the, the, the cloud giants, they are, they are of course, liking uh, the idea of pooling data. So they are actually putting a lot of resources or interest into something called homomorphic encryption, where, you are, where it tries to make it possible to pool the data and do your computations on the encrypted data. So that, that's, that's their solution to privacy. The problem with that is that it doesn't really scale. It's, it's very, very far from general machine learning use cases. It's still are highly academic. It can be used for, for small scale data, for simple computations like aggregation. It, it is available for general computation, but the performance and the, the cost of doing that is, is very far from being practical. But that's, I think, an, an area that they are very interested in. So if you have one library from IBM, for example, there's one from Microsoft called Seal. This is not federated learning. This is another way to tackle the mm -hmm. privacy that, that we believe in that technology. We think it's nice and we are going to use it for parts, for example, securing aggregation of small scalar values or small vectors like in the, the aggregating scores. But we don't think it is, we are not there that we can do that on scale for the local training. Uh, so essentially that, and then we, we are, you know, we're, we're, start, we're going to start looking now for, for partnerships in this area. Uh, and also, of course, in, in the area of research. And I would say just very quickly about some of the research challenges that we're, we're coming up to the end of time here. But I mean, of course, uh, scalability and performance of machine learning models in a decentralized setting is very important for the success of the technology. Uh, we need to be able to, to do state-of-the-art machine learning models as efficiently as possible. In some cases, in this case, we have picked, a, we are developing a technology where that essentially translates very easily to federated setting. But in other cases, the algorithms need to be researched and modified. This is something we, and uh, this is kind of where a lot of the academic, not just us, but globally are going into. But the research and machine learning we touched upon, I mean, what, what to do about data poisoning, um, anomaly detection for, for how do you handle dishonest numbers? We see, Two, two big directions there. One is technological. I mean, how can we do anomaly detection? How can we uh, use decentralized protocols to, uh, to a, work a consensus? It's a hard problem. People are writing paper about that. Another, another area that can be almost research as well is sort of on the business development side. I mean, how do you make it irrational? To, how, how do you try to make that behavior irrational? That can also be a very promising approach to tackle all that. I mean, trying to make sure that Jens doesn't gain anything from lying about his vacation. Uh, <laughs> unless he's just a really bad person. <laughs> there are really bad persons, of course. Yeah. We're, not, we're not thinking about this also, like we're not targeting the end consumer. We're not going to make a, a, a huge uh, public system out of this. This is kind of like business to business situation still. So I mean, there should be some, some gain in being part of this alliance. There should be some, it should not be worth destroying. And also then decentralized computation, like I said, um, is about also trying to do as much as you can without having to rely on a third party trust provider. That can be important in situations. You can look at things like we're looking at consensus protocols for part of this computation. So I think we are eventually going to need both to be able to configure it with a, an enterprise third party system like we did today, but, but in other situations it might be better or easier or more trustworthy to have a decentralized stuff. So I mean, I, I can talk more about that um, later. I, I was almost done. I just want, I had a few slides about that you can come and talk to me about or come and see me at the university about <laughs> privacy in computation. I mean, there are concepts called differential privacy, for example. Have you heard about that? It's a rigorous mathematical framework essentially for protecting against inference attacks. So we talked about data poisoning. Another problem is if you have access to the model, you might try to infer the data. This is a really hard problem. It takes a lot of computation, but it's possible. So differential privacy is a very interesting concept that you essentially add controlled noise to your data in a way that you uh, protect the model mm -hmm. against this type of attacks. Um, 
um, conform a prediction. I just wanted to highlight that because that's Ola's research topic. It's a, it's a it's a framework for machine learning. Have anyone heard about that? It's a way to do machine learning that gives you valid confidence in the results. So it results in prediction intervals or set predictions. In my case, for example, I wrote a seven there. It could have returned a set two, seven, three if I gave a confidence interval. And so it, it will tell you that it's not sure. So that actually the model will, will know, have information on how applicable is this to new data. It will be able to measure that and it will be rigorous. So if you say that the model is 80% accurate or the precision is 80, then it will actually be that and not anything else. It will not just be that when you test it, it will be that and it will tell you something on the data. So that this, and these algorithms are quite amenable to the federated settings. So this will be part of our next MP. And there is actually a bit of research. Uh, uh, and just a picture there. Federated learning, there's a lot of ways to do, to protect it in privacy. Uh, we don't think that that you should you should pick homomorphic encryption and pull your data and try to do that. That will not work. You should not try to protect it with only differential privacy. But if you do federated learning, that's a really good baseline because you don't actually share the data. That's, that's good. And then, then you move that to a standard best practice of security augmented by some of these nice concepts that will protect, that will increase the protection and partial the system. So that's kind of how we are thinking about the problem and pushing our resources into research time. So that, thank you very much. I think we're done. It was a little bit longer than I thought, but I think we had some nice discussions along the way as well. Thank you very much. Uh, on behalf of everyone here, I guess. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so one question uh, that, uh, for just how can we, or anyone else that will test it, uh, get in contact with you or get to know more about what you're doing, uh, your work? What's the easiest way? The easiest way is, is either to use um, our contact form on the web page or just email us directly or call me or talk to me. Yeah, exactly. You have your email address. Exactly, I have my email address here. Exactly. <coughs> I had it. Where did I have it? Yes, there. All right. It's just my name as the assistance. I mean, you can talk to me or the one or more than anyone, yeah. essentially. Well, thank you very much. Thanks yes. for the But I do think it was important, the other one, like, again, that, that we are looking for. So, two, yes. two things, actually. So, because really, you could, it, we can do as much as we like with main up cases, right? So, but we're really looking for some real use cases that we can co-develop with yeah. someone else in, in industry that has these real problems. Because yeah. then you get also to answer and develop real solutions to real problems. So, all the things that we are not experiencing yeah. right now in the development that we have. So, that's... I mean, there we can foresee different different modes of collaboration. Yeah. I think you are very willing to discuss those with Absolutely. anyone who's interested. Mm -hmm. yep. yeah. So you can, and then on the other side also, in different kinds of research proposals and, and these public funding projects. Because uh, this is just a potential technology that can slot into other projects. And exactly, and absolutely. this is the important point. In the end, this is a platform that will let you build products like the digitization tool, but, mm -hmm. but they're doing something useful. And I mean, it, it is really those products that, that you should care about. That's what you want to make. That's something that makes life nicer for, for yourselves and your clients. Um, so what we are building is very fancy plumbing for making this a new case. Mm. And, and now, when you think about this, you think about a lot about ethics and privacy. Obviously, I don't think if anyone maybe in this kind of sense of instruments uh, one thing you can also imagine is that this, this could be a way to create quite strong lock-in effects as well. If you are part of an alliance that is going to be at some point, it will be very, very hard to, um, to not be part of it if you want to make a model as good as the alliance model. And this can also be a way for smaller parties to compete with, with those with larger resources to collect it by collaborating. This is one other way to think about the camera. Thank you very much. Yes. This, uh, I, yeah. Yeah. I just had a question. Uh, we haven't talked so much about it, I guess, but in practical use, I think data management and how can you, uh, I mean, even when you share data, you usually, when you get the data from other parties, you see that, oh, this data is not like my data. Mm. And uh, I, I guess in practice, 
practice, you, you need to synchronize how you yeah. reprocess yeah. data, yeah. you can normalize it, yeah. how you remove yes. bad data, yes. 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 annotations, stuff like that. Do you have any thoughts about how, how to do that? Part? Yes, we don't have, we have thoughts, we don't have solutions yet, but this is certainly something we will discuss. And I mean, this is part of the alliance formation and initiation phases. I mean, inevitably, I mean, that, that will be like you said. Uh, there will be some negotiations and agreement, mm -hmm. and someone will actually sit down and do that, that hard work. Um, it's not too much, it's not different from uh, data. It, it's, it's a data management problem. Yeah. So that, that, that you will not solve. But I can guess it's, it's, it gets even more. Um, usually that's the big part, like it is. Yeah, 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 and yeah. in this case, you, you're also sitting in, uh, not with the same data sets, and, and you, but you need to use them in the same model. Yes, yes. So, and, so, and so what we have been talking about is like um, using like maybe like linked data or something like that, like a semantic web, and being able to like publish the the, the meta layer of mm -hmm. that, so you can expose um, uh, your your kind of your schema that you're that you're gonna run against. Yeah, uh, then you will uh, then you can. Then you can like merge those schemas uh, and build the computation on layer above. I think I mean that, that we will start addressing this problem, but this is also the reason I mentioned instruments, mm -hmm. where where some prior work has gone into maybe standardizing uh, data formats, for example. Mm -hmm. That would of course make the threshold smaller for lower for starting with Just before any other questions, uh, now we're up uh, on time. It's eleven o'clock.